41 is where we're going to be in the Word of God this evening. And uh, thank you so much, church. All you've done for me and providing for me and making me feel right at home here in Londonderry and at Victory Baptist Church. And thank you, Pastor, for bringing me. Isaiah chapter number 41. And the prophet Isaiah, this is a, what we call a major, um, a, a major prophet. The, the, we've got the minor prophets, and this is one of the major prophets. Not because it's more important or because the minor prophets. Prophets are less important, but because it's bigger in size and takes up, it fills up more of the Old Testament than maybe the minor prophets. It's a bigger book. That's why we call it a, a major prophet. We come to Isaiah, and we're talking a lot about prophecy. When we dig deep into Isaiah, we find uh, the prophecy concerning Jesus Christ, His coming, His virgin birth, His vicarious death, uh, and, and we find a prophecy about uh, King Cyrus and his life. And so we're talking about uh, prophecy. We're talking about what's going to happen in the future. And Isaiah is going to tell us some things here in Isaiah chapter number 41. And we'll begin in verse number 1. It says this, Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment, who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword, and as driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. The isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came. They helped everyone his neighbor, and everyone said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. And this will be our text verse where we will begin. Fear thou not, listen to this, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Look at the first part of that verse. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Lord, help us as we go into your word tonight. Strengthen us through it and speak to our hearts. May we be open to whatever it is you have for us. Lord, empty me of self. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And may we get something from your word this evening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I am with thee. Tonight the message is going to be one of uh, textual, and I love messages that are textual, where you dig it deep into a passage and really find a truth from the Word of God, but we're going to go by a topic, I am with thee. And we're going to look through different verses, different places in Scripture where God says to His people, I am with thee, or I am with you. So we looked in uh, Isaiah, and, and notice number, uh, verse number 4, Who hath wrought and done it? calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, the first, and get this, and with the last, I am here. Remember we said earlier, this is a book of prophecy. So this is a book, um, we're going into the future, and we're looking at things that are going to happen. And he says here, notice it says, I, the Lord, the first, and with the last. That tells me God's already there in our future. Whatever storms we're about to face, oh, whatever fire trial we're about to go through, God's already there and He's already been to the other side of the storm. He's already been there. He knows what's going to happen and He knows how to get us through. And we can take consolation in that because God knows exactly what we're about to go through. Uh, one man wrote this, prophecy is pre-written history. Whatever we go through, God's already been there. And I want to look at four different things God says, I am with thee, and what that's going to do for us. First of all, it's going to give us some conviction. It's going to convict us. When we know that God is with us, it's going to convict us, first of all, for salvation. When we got saved, there was conviction of our sins. We had to realize that because of our sins, we deserve to die and to go to a place called hell. And because we didn't want to go there, because we wanted to go to heaven and spend eternity with Christ, we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. First of all, when he says, I am with thee, it's going to bring conviction for salvation. John 16, 13 says this, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, talking about the Holy Spirit, is come, he will guide you into all 
truth, there had to be conviction from the Holy Spirit for us to accept Christ as our Savior. 1 John 5, 6 says this, This is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. The Spirit that gave witness of Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God, but that He is God. And the Spirit gave witness of that in our hearts when we accepted Christ. John 6, says this, No man can come to Me except the Father which hath sent Me draw him. It's God the Father who draws us into salvation and the Holy Spirit which convicts us of our sins. It's conviction only for salvation, but sin in our lives. It's like this when the, uh, when the Paul, remember Apostle Paul? When he was Saul, he was persecuting the church of Christ. He was, he, was murdering, he was murdering Christians. And in Acts chapter number 9, he comes on this road of Damascus. God shines a light, a light down upon Paul, or Saul at this time, and he convicts him of his sin. He convicts him of the things that he had done in the past, and he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why kickest thou against the pricks? And we know Saul was miraculously saved that day because there was conviction of his sin when Christ came into his life. When the presence of God showed upon him, there was conviction. And he got saved. In Genesis chapter number 3, turn there with me really quick. Genesis chapter number 3, get your hands ready and your fingers warmed up. We're going to be turning to a few different places in Scripture this, this evening. But in Genesis chapter number 3, this is the place, and we know it well. The first sin here on earth. The first sin in this world. Adam and Eve, God created them in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter number 3. They've just sinned. Satan has come to Eve as a serpent says, shall you not eat of every tree of the garden? Satan gave him three lies. The first was an exaggerated lie. He said, shall you not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God really say every tree? Because there's one that he didn't say. So it's an exaggerated lie. Then there was a second lie. We're going to look here. And the serpent uh, said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. This is a half truth. He said, uh, ye shall not surely die when ye eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Ye shall not surely die. We know this is a half-truth, which is, we know, a full lie. It was a half-truth because we know, in fact, that they weren't going to die physically, but spiritually they were going to die. Death in the Bible represents this, a separation. One is the separation of the soul from the body. Uh, Paul said to be absent uh, from the body is to be present with the Lord. So one separation, or one, one, one meaning of death, a separation is the body uh, from the soul, from the soul from the body. And the second one is from separation from God. Death means separation from God. For the wages of sin is death. Separation from God. And we know this is um, a half-truth because they were going to die spiritually. And then there's a third lie he told them, which is just a bold-faced lie. Let me find it here. Oh, we're in Genesis chapter number 3. I was in chapter 2. There we go. And the serpent said to them, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He said, if you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you do this sin, you're going to be as gods. You're going to be just as God is. A bold face lie. So we see that there was conviction of sin. But look at verse number 8 in Genesis chapter 3. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. When we understand that God is with us, when He says, I am with thee, it's going to bring conviction of our sins. They here had sinned, and now they're hiding from the presence of God. And what a sad thing, when we have to hide from the presence of God, we're so convicted by our own sin. So they, had to, uh, they were convicted of their sin. And then this, we'll get convicted from relying on our own strength. Conviction from relying on our own strength. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to turn there really quick and read a couple of verses to you. Paul here is writing to the church at Corinth. When God is with us, it's going to convict us of our own strength. Paul here, pastor actually used this example this morning. He, he's given a thorn in the flesh and he beseeches God thrice for this thorn in the flesh. And we know Paul went through many things in life. This is in verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. 
And he said unto me, this is Christ being, if you have a red letter edition Bible, you can see Christ is speaking here. It says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Then Paul says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Just before uh, me and my dad drove up here uh, to New Hampshire, we were working on the truck, getting some things together, and we did an oil change. We decided we're going to do an oil change. Now, I'd done it on a car before, but this is my first time doing it on the truck. And so I kind of wanted him to guide me. But if you have a relationship with someone that you're kind of alike, me and my dad are a lot alike in some ways, um, sometimes that's really good and, and you enjoy things together, but sometimes you, you clash on things. And this was one of those things we kind of, we don't get a, a mean spirit towards each other, but we kind of clash because dad wants to come in and he wants to show me by doing it. So he wants to do the oil change. Uh, and then I want to learn by doing it, by him telling me how to do it. So we're going to clash. Uh, we're not going to have a mean spirit. But the thing is, uh, when I need help and he needs to show me how to do something, I want to watch it. And then he's going to keep going and doing it. And then I have to kind of walk away because I'm really wanting to do it, but I'm not wanting to say anything to him. And then when I'm doing the oil change and I'm uh, twisting the bolts and trying to uh, do, do some things there with the oil, Dad has to walk away. He doesn't want to watch me do it because he wants to do it. He wants to do the oil change. I want to do the oil change. And that's kind of, I wonder if that's some, sometimes how we are with God. I want to do it in my strength. I want to be the one to do that when God can do it so much better. If we just rely on His strength and not our own, when we realize that we're weak and that He has more knowledge, when we realize He's with us, it's going to convict us that I can't do things in my own strength. That His way is so much the better. So first of all, when we realize God says, I am with thee, it's going to bring us conviction. Number two, though, it's going to bring us some consolation. It's going to bring us consolation. Isaiah chapter number 41, verse 10. We were just there. Turn them back there with me. Isaiah 41, 10. He says, Fear thou not. We can have consolation in that. Fear thou not, I am with thee. But then he says this, Be not dismayed. That word dismayed is talking about uh, being downtrodden by a circumstance. Something comes in our life and it discourages us. Be not dismayed. Don't be discouraged because of the things of life. For I am thy God. Then he says this, I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. And I will uphold thee. Not by your own righteousness. Not because you're a good person. But I'm going to uphold thee because of what I've done for you. I'm going to uphold thee because of who I am. God says, I will uphold thee. And we can take consolation when we rely on His strength and not our own. He says, I am with thee. Some circumstances that we will go through in life, we're not going to completely understand why we have to go through those things. Uh, Genesis chapter uh, number 26, verse number 24 I'm going to read it to you. Isaac right here is um, digging some wells. He's come to Ahimelech. And this is a man that Abraham had gone before him and dug some wells. And then the Philistines had come around and they had filled in all the wells that Abraham had, had dug. And then um, Isaac comes and he's wanting to dig all these wells. He comes to Abimelech. Abimelech says, no, you've become too mighty for this land. You have to go, Isaac. And so Isaac goes. And then in verse number, let me find my verse here. Uh, verse number 24. He's trying to build wells. And people are coming up and they're digging the wells that Isaac had just dug. They're filling it in. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee. And will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. So Isaac is trying to build the wells. And people are coming in. It's just like a, oh, when kids are on the sand and they're building our sand castle and they're making it look really nice and somebody comes over and kicks it over. And now they have no more sand castle. All that work done for nothing. Isaac is going and he's trying to fill these wells. He's trying to build all these wells that his father had built. And these people are coming in and filling them in. And he's getting discouraged and God comes to him and he says, I am with thee. Jeremiah chapter number 42 Verse number 11, you don't have to turn there. It says, Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. We can take consolation in that. Jeremiah 46, 28 says, Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee. 
we can have consolation knowing that Christ, that God Himself is with us. There in Elijah, sorry, not Elijah, we were in Jeremiah, but think of the, with me with the story of Elijah. Elijah had prophesied of the drought in first, I believe it was in uh, First Kings, and I'm going to turn there quickly as you're listening. First Kings, uh, uh, Elijah had, had prophesied of a drought, and then it happened. He had done many great miracles for the Lord. He had performed a miracle for the widow woman. He had raised a dead boy, brought him to life through the power of the Lord. He challenged Ahab. He brings fire from heaven upon the prophets uh, for all to see. And then, this is a whole message in of itself, but a woman comes to him and says, I'm coming for you. And now he's scared. He had done all these great things in the power of God, and Jezebel says, I'm coming after him. And, and he goes through and he says, now I'm scared and lonely. And we're in 1 Kings. I'm trying to find this passage. And it's right here. 1 Kings, at the very end of 1 Kings, chapter number, chapter number eight, uh, 19. Chapter number 18, at the very end of 18. No, I was wrong. It's chapter 19, right here, chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. Elijah's lonely. He's wondering why God has done all these things for him and how God has used him in great ways and now someone's coming after his life and he's fearful. The verse number 4 says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a juniper tree. And he requested of himself that he might die. He had done all these great things for the Lord and now he's asking for death. And we'll go down here in verse number 11, and he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire a still small voice. He had gone, God had sent a strong wind. And sometimes in life, we're going to go through the strong winds of compromise. People are going to leave. The winds are going to change and go the wrong way. And sometimes an earthquake will come. The attacks of Satan are going to shake you. And they're going to uh, question your faith. Uh, the fiery trials of God, well, he'll, he'll allow trials to go through your life. You'll go through financial needs. You'll go through spiritual needs, physical needs. And we'll have that fiery trials. But then he'll send a still, small voice. And then all the things that we go through in life, the winds, the earthquakes, the fire, God will whisper, I am with thee. I remember uh, it was my junior year of Bible college, and I told myself, I'm not going to get emotional. I'm not an emotional guy, but th uh, this one kind of gets me sometimes, so I'm not, I'm not going to get emotional on you. Uh, some of you have faced far greater trials than I have. Um, and you can probably tell great stories of how the Lord spoke to you. I had gone through a time in my life, my junior year, I was at Bible college, so I'm studying, I'm trying to stay focused, trying to work my way through, and um, not too long before, I had found out some stuff was happening in my home church, and uh, we had gone through it before, so, and, and God brought us through it, I can say now, and looking back, His way is perfect, and I understand what he's doing now, but then I didn't understand all that was going on, all the trials we were going through, uh, that my church was going through while I was away at college. But not only the things back home were, were happening, but God had just sent something my way I wasn't really expecting. At one point, I had I'd called my dad, and I was wanting to come home from Bible college in the middle of the semester. And I didn't know... I didn't really understand what was going on. I didn't really want to be there anymore. And I was, I didn't really understand what was going on. Dad told me to stay. Some other people said, why don't you just stay for a little while, see how it goes. And so I did. And I was feeling lonely, so I was going to the church house a little bit early. Church started at 6 on Sunday night, and I, was, I would be there about 5.20, uh, a little bit when the orchestra would get there. And I would just uh, sit in there and try to pray and, and talk with God and, and share my heart with Him. And it was one particular Sunday. It was I Love My Church Sunday. They had a guest speaker in. And I was really struggling right before the service. And then all the people filled the auditorium, and I was feeling oh, almost like I was the only person there. I, was, I felt lonely. 
And it's funny how God will give you a nugget of truth. He'll give you an encouragement right when you need it. The choir came up, and immediately they sang this, uh, the, the first song they sang, and I remember it, I remember it vividly. The line, the, the line from the chorus, as soon as they got to the chorus, God struck my heart. They sang this song, I am with thee, I am with thee, through the fire, through the flood, you are covered by his blood, for I am with thee. The choir sang that song, I am with thee. And then the preacher gets up. He turns to a passage. I can't remember what passage it was. It was one of these that we've gone through tonight. And he, and he reads the verse, and then he gets to the middle of the verse. In the middle of that verse says, Fear not, for I am with thee. And God struck my heart. And I've kept that with me ever since. It was something of consolation. I was in a deep trial, and I didn't understand what God was doing in my life. And I was struggling with it, wanting to quit college. And God said, Drew, fear not. I am with thee. Church, fear not. Today in the ages of of which we live, there are compromises raging, and politics, uh, it's going downhill, and all these things. Fear not, for I am with thee. It'll bring us, sometimes it'll give us conviction. Sometimes we need it. I am with thee for consolation. Number three, it'll give you courage. When we understand that God is with us, it'll give us courage. Isaiah uh, chapter number 43. Uh, We've already looked in chapter number 41, but Isaiah chapter number 43. And I'm getting there, Jeremiah. I'm back in Isaiah chapter number 43. And it's verse number... Verse number, uh, we'll start in verse number one. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. Oh, get this, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall a flame kindle upon thee. Verse number five, fear not, for I am with thee. He says, when thou passest, through the waters. When it seems like we're going upstream in the world we live in today, when it's not popular what we're doing, when we're not accepted as a fundamental, independent, fundamental Baptist, trying to give the gospel to a lost world, and the, and the world seems like they're rejecting it. When we're going upstream, he says, I will be with thee. And then we're going uh, through the rivers when we're drowning through all the circumstances of life, and it just seems like I can't get a breath. He says this, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest, through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. I thought of this, what pastor said this morning. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, they stood up for what's right in King Nebuchadnezzar. They threw them in the flames in the fiery furnace. And what happened? The presence of God. Nebuchadnezzar looked in. He saw a fourth man walking around. And they saw the presence of God. And I wonder while they were in there. The Bible doesn't say this, but I wonder if he said... I am with thee. I'm with you, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I wonder if in the lion's den, when Daniel oh, was in there for standing up for right, for praying three times a day, not giving up his convictions, if he remembered when God said, I am with thee. It ought to give us courage to do what's right, to stand for what's right. It ought to give us courage to proclaim the Word of God. In Matthew chapter number 19, sorry, chapter number 28, you know where I'm going. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. He says, uh, Matthew 28, verse number 19, at the very end, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. It's Jesus speaking. And he says, And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So when he gives the Great Commission, he says, Lo, I am with you. I will be with you as you go and proclaim the gospel. We can not only just have courage to proclaim the word of God, but to perform, to perform the work of the Lord in Haggai chapter number 1 and verse number 13. The, the Lord says, Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger and the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. Chapter 2 verse 4 says, uh, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Jozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. In this passage in Haggai, uh, they're, they're, they're wanting to build the wall. God gives them a command to build the wall. The wall that Solomon had built had already been destroyed. And they're wanting to build a new wall. 
I'm uh, sorry, a new temple, a temple to the Lord. God says, I have no place for me to dwell. And they're wanting to build a temple to the Lord. But some of the older people remembered Solomon's temper, temple and all of its splendor and glory and the magnificent structures that they had created. And they're getting discouraged because this temple isn't like Solomon's temple. It's not as extravagant. And God says, work, I am with you. So we can, who not only gives us courage to proclaim the word of God, it gives us courage to perform the work of the Lord. Number four, and this is the final point, we're closing. When we know God is with us, when He says, I am with thee, we're left to make a choice. We're left to make a choice. Exodus chapter number 17. I'm going to read this to you. Verse number 7, And He called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? God had used Moses to exodus the people from Pharaoh and from Egypt. God had used Moses to part the Red Sea. God had led them by a fire by night, a cloud, a cloud of pillar by day, a pillar of cloud by day, parted the Red Sea, given them quail to eat, manna from heaven. And now they're thirsty and they say, is God really with us? He's just done all these great things. And he says, is God with us? We're left with a choice tonight. God's provided each step of the way. How will you answer that question? Have you come to the point where you've had to ask that question, is God with us or not? Genesis chapter number 28, Jacob's at Bethel. He had just laid and saw Jacob, or, and he just saw the ladder in his dream. I'm going to turn there and read you a verse real quick. Genesis chapter number 28. We're talking about Jacob. He just had this dream. God comes to him and says, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again unto this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And then Jacob, he comes, he sets up a pillar. Uh, from the stones that he had just stepped on. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, this is it, he makes this choice, then shall the Lord be my God. We've got to make that choice. The Lord will be my God. Maybe some of you need to make that choice tonight. The Lord will be my God. I will choose Him. But maybe some of you just need to Make the choice to continue in the work of the Lord. Maybe you need to make the choice because He'll be with me. I can continue on for Him in the work just like those in Haggai did. Hard times come and hard times go, but we must not waver. He won't ever waver on us. He'll never change on us. We need to make that choice. I won't waver. I won't stand. Why? Because God says this, I am with you.